dear student let us begin lectures on machine design part 1 this is lecture number 17 and the topic is design of threaded fasteners now in the last lecture that is on lecture number 16 we have learned different uh, geometrical profiles of different kinds of threads and now threaded fasteners as we have discussed they are very very useful and in many machine parts the parts are joined together by means of threaded fasteners so design is very very important for this kind of machine elements in this lecture we are going to learn how to design such a threaded fastener now let us come to the design now the design will depend on definitely on the material selected for the fasteners so these are what you are seeing is uh, a list of the screw materials now the screw materials will be chosen depending on the application temperature of the applications now the room temperature applications the materials are low carbon steel low carbon steel this is for the light structure and may be medium carbon steel but it must be heat treated the, there are various processes of heat treatment and these are all uh, specified in standards so when you have to design such um, a threaded fastener so you will have to look into the standard there are different material standard and the medium carbon steel with different kinds of heat treatments are possible quenching and tempering these are the two uh, most useful uh, that is most frequently used heat treatment process for the high temperature the alloys are used now titanium based alloys are used for high temperature then as the temperature goes high then we use martensitic chromium steel here the chromium is added then inconel for a very high temperature inconel and super alloys are to be used so this information is very much essential in order to design uh, a threaded fasteners for any design we want to we first need the informations about the materials because everything will be designed based on the material properties so these are the materials used for the screws and fasteners then comes the strength of the bolts now strength of a machine element is not the same as the uh, ultimate stress of a material because this is a uh, this is the strength is the property of the element now there are standards specifying the strength the metric standards metric standard specifies the strength the bowl strength according to different property class of materials there are different property classes of materials namely ISO grades and for different property classes we have the uh, d um, the bowl standard specified the standard in in any uh, design handbook in the standard you will find there are two things one is minimum yield strength and minimum ultimate strength so when we have uh, design any bolt then we must see that the minimum yield strength is satisfied and minimum ultimate strength is obtained so these are again very important considerations for the design the bolt strength as well as the material selected for the bolts and nuts as well and screws now then we come to designing of bolt now the design of bolt will definitely depend on in which application it is used so there may be a case where the loading is normally static static loading means that it does not vary with time or it varies very slowly with time it starts from 0 and reaches one uh, steady state value after a long time interval so this is the static loading in uh, static loading there may be cases where the pre stress is applied and where the pre stress is not applied we are going to discuss separately these two where the pre stress is applied and there is no pre stress and there may be the loading where the loading varies um, in cyclic manner or it, it may it will have a fluctuating loading take for example 
one foundation which supports let us say this is the foundation which supports one machinery which contains some rotating elements. So, this is the motor for example, which rotates. Now, definitely there will be some unbalance in the motor because of the manufacturing defects. So, and this motor is bolted to the ground. Now, as it rotates, so there will be a fluctuating force develop and if you calculate, if you find out the free body diagram, the normal stress here on each of the bolt will have a fluctuating component. So, if you vary, if you plot f against time, then you will see the variation looks somewhat like this. So, this is fluctuating stress. Then <coughs> there may be other situations. Let me give you one more example. The situation where, so this is, let us consider the connecting rod of a crankshaft. So, this part goes to piston. And a bolt is applied here, a bolt is there and this part goes to piston and now all of us know that in the piston whenever the uh, engine operates the, the uh, force developed on the piston becomes say somewhat like this, a very cyclical fluctuations, but that force will always cause some fluctuating component in the bolts. So, there are various cases where the machine parts will have fluctuating forces. Normally, machines are made to transmit power from one uh, source to the other to transform and transmit power and definitely there will be some movement. So, whenever there is some movement, there will be always flux inertial forces and definitely some other fluctuating forces. So, this fluctuating forces will be transmitted from one joint to the other through these bolts. So, bolts definitely or the joint members will be subject to the uh, ten, uh, fluctuating forces all the time. So, definitely that is very important uh, thing to consider for while join while designing a bolt. We are going to study some design criteria for variable loading. There may be cases where the loading is impact. So, this occurs for example, in punching machine where the impact occurs definitely the bolts connected uh, for various parts will also uh, experience some impact load. Now, static loading without pre-stress. Here, we see that there are, we are going to study in uh, some more details, but what is important that whenever we have a static loading without pre-stress, then the bolts must be designed such a way that the bolt does not break under tension. So, it is possible that the bolt may break under tension. The threads are not crushed. So, there will be bearing stress across uh, the thread and that may cause the failure of the thread. So, threads may get damaged. We are going to avoid that by proper designing. The threads do not fail by shear. So, this is one mode of failure where the threads may fail by shear. The roots will have adequate uh, strength to sustain the shear stress. So, this is uh, these are one uh, the few important things failure modes we, which we have to consider. Let us now come to one example design example. Let us consider a case where an I bar is used to lift a load. So, here what I am drawing, drawing And this is the threaded member. 
and here we have a knot. Maybe we have to extend this. So, this is not and a load is applied here. So, this carries a load. Definitely here there is no pre stress and these are applied these are used for the lifting certain load. Now, let us consider this screw. What happens to this screw uh, or this bolt that it is subjected to tensile force. So, when let us let me draw the screw in a so this one ultimately this is the part connected to the nut so and there is a pressure force here so therefore what happens is that if you consider this part it is subjected to a tensile load and what will be the the tensile stress developed the tensile stress is definitely sigma is equal to p divided by a and the area of cross sections now what is the most vulnerable sections that is definitely here the root area there are uh, few areas specified when you look up at the table so one is the root area so that is this minor diameter if you remember this is this is the area corresponding to minor diameter so this let me call it as at which is the uh, the root area of the thread and so this is the maximum stress developed and this must be less than sigma allowable we know all sigma allowable is sigma ultimate or divided by factor of safety. Now, we will have to choose a t such that given a force p we have to choose a t such that this condition is satisfied and we know that a t is pi by 4 d uh, let us say d c square where is the c is the code diameter. Now, we select the code diameter and then in the table we find out uh, what is the the root area that is code diameter and then we select the next higher size of the of the thread. So, this is how the thread is selected here. Now, there are other modes of failure as we have mentioned in the last slide that is the shear failure as well as the bearing failure that is a crushing failure. Now, we see that the the force between this knot and the screw here or knot and the bolt it depends on various factors. So, let me draw the scaled way. So, this is let me call it this is the part of this screw and the other part is corresponding to the knot. So, this is for the knot. So, definitely there will be the clearance between the knot and the uh, and the thread and threads of the bolts. So, this clearance again it will it will also uh, say what will be the total total area of contact and this is the total this is the area of contact over which the bearing pressure will act, but this is very complicated for analysis. So, we have to make very rough estimate of that because the rough uh, why rough because we can provide adequate fa factor of safety such that the uh, bolt does not fail even if we have a very rough estimate that is even if the design details are uh, not very accurate, but with a large safety factor we can 
of course uh, make the design quite safe. Now what is the uh, simplifications in design or in analysis? The simplification is that the forces are uniformly distributed. So, if you draw, so if I consider this to be something like the screw profile, of course I have not drawn the taper and the exact thread geometry, but for rough estimate it does not matter and the force is acting over here. So, on each surface there will be forces. So, if there are n such threads, then the total force acting per thread is P prime is equal to P divided by n and this is uniformly distributed. So, then what will be the total bearing stress? Sigma bearing will be P prime divided by the area of cross section, area on which the force is applied and that is equal to this area. If you take this total circum, this is the total disc. So, this will be equal to pi by 4 d outer or d major square minus d minor square and sigma bearing it must be less than the sigma compression allowable. Now, here from this we can find out what are the values of minor diameter and major diameter etcetera etcetera. Given uh, one diameter we can find out what will be the other diameter that is the, the width of the or, or the uh, height of the thread. Now, it may seem that if we increase n then sigma b uh, goes down because if you see that if you a increase n p prime decreases. So, therefore, sigma b decreases, but this is not in fact true because here the analysis is so simplified that it is hardly realized in practice. What happens is that when the first few threads uh, where the contact first appears that is that is here. So, this is the screw profile and this is the knot let us say so this is the knot here we apply suppose the force p so here what is normally observed is that the first few threads first two or three uh, threads will take the lion's share or the majority of the load the other threads as we progressively uh, go from this side to the other side this directions then the load taken by each of the thread will be very very small a nonlinear distribution is uh, actually observed where the load taken by the first thread is almost 37 percent this is 37 percent and it decreases very fast and beyond six or seven threads it hardly carries any load so here this uh, this assumptions that this load is uniformly distributed over the uh, cross sections as well as ov over the over each uh, thread is not entirely justified and we will have to make more elaborate calculations. So, um, here what we normally do we take n equal to 1, but we take this load to be 37 percent of the entire load. So, we calculate based on a single thread which takes 37 percent of the load. So, this is uh, this gives fairly good results. Then there is another mode of failure which is which is the shear failure and if you see that the thread this is the thread where the force is acting 
and if you make the same assumptions that is each of the thread will carry a force P prime and now this behaves like cantilever beam and therefore the shear stress here on this sections which is the plane for maximum shear the shear stress will be P divided by so tau is P prime divided by the area area is this height so pi dc times this height h let us say. So if we have a large h then the shear stress is less therefore uh, the BSW thread which has a very um, large value of h it, it has a great root strength uh, as we have discussed in the last slide but um, here the analysis uh, also confirms that. So the, here tau must be less than tau allowable and tau allowable is roughly equal to sigma allowable divided by under root 3. This is uh, these are the major stresses uh, experienced by a thread in a bolt. So there may be um, there are uh, tensile stress as well as um, compressive stress again uh, the shear stress. So we can have when all the types of stress are, uh, stresses are available then we can use the, uh, the various the failure formula that is von Mises theory of failure which says that you will have to calculate the sigma equivalent which is equal to sigma square plus thrice tau square or you can take tau tau max which is equal to sigma by 2 under root square plus tau square. Now here sigma prime must be less than sigma allowable and this must be less than sig tau allowable. This uses the maximum shear stress theory whereas that uses the von Mises theory of failure. So this is how a, a bolt is to be designed when there is no pre-stress. Now let us see what happens when there is P-stress. Now whenever there is a pre-stress then we have certain advantage. We, we are going to see what are those advantage in some more details but here what is mentioned that the advantage of pre-stress is to relieve the bolts partly from external load. So we will gradually see what are the uh, advantages but here now see what the methods of pre-stressing. When we have, uh, when we want to pre-stress then there are few methods, one very well uh, justified method is the torque wrench method what we, ha what we use a torque wrench which gives um, a measured value of torque. The turn of the knot method is just the method where we just first tighten the knot by hand that is it is hand tightened and then we give a few turns by means of a wrench. Now how much turn is to be given that is calibrated but the calibration technique is quite complicated and we are not going to discuss here. There are other various advanced techniques like hydraulic stretching etc. Normally it is very difficult to find out what will be the pre-stress value but based on some empirical relationship that is some experimental results we can get that this ex initial value initial tension is equal to 2840 d where d is the diameter nominal diameter of the thread um, of the bolt in um, millimeter and this is in Newton. So normally this initial force is given. In the next slide we are going to see how does this pre-stressing helping relieving the bolts from the external load. So let us consider the case where one cylinder cover is bolted. Here there is this 
this is the cylinder cover and this is part is the cylinder and this is used for containing some pressurized fluid. So, therefore, this must be leak proof that is we must have a gasket here. So, this is known as gasket. and this is bolted. So, you use a bolt over here. Now, <coughs> we tighten it. The load taken by the bolt is now uh, will, will cause some initial tension here. As you can see that whenever we tighten, then if you consider the free body diagram of this cover plate, then as we tighten it by giving some torque, then what you see here, the force is here, it, it presses and the gasket also initial force. So, the gasket also gives a pressure. So, if you draw the free body diagram of the bolt, then it looks like so there is F initial and F initial over here. So, so this causes initial tension. Now, this tensile force is again increase if we apply external load here. So, now what we are going to do we apply F external on this cover plate and see what happens. The cover plate when we apply external force here then the bowls there are different bowls of there are a number of bowls equally spaced along the periphery of the uh, along some well along some circle of uh, on the cover plate if you draw the free the top view of the cylinder then what you see so if this is a cylinder then there will be number of bowls here there is another bowl The number will depend on this diameter of the cover plate. If you see the standard on pressure vessels, then this distance will have some minimum value. So, this length P must be greater than some P minimum. So, all these considerations will give you what are the number of bowls to be used here. Now, once you use that, then if external is applied on the pressure uh, on this cover plate. So, each one each bolt will take a uh, the equal amount of external load. Let us consider that one particular bolt takes this load if external. Although we mean that if external is actually the load taken by the entire cover. Now, based on that we can find out what will be the new load on the bolt. The new load on the bolt, what we can do is that we can find out the, again we draw the free body diagram of the cover plate. So, this is the cover plate and we have this force if fasteners say and here if joint and this is if external. So, therefore, we have one equilibrium equations that is if j plus if external minus if f is equal to 0, but this is not sufficient to calculate if j and if f separately. 
f j is the force experienced by this joint that is the gasket force. We make then this is statically indeterminate problem then we will have to use the kinematic relationship. Now we consider the bolts to be flexible that is it has some um, longitudinal flexibility flex flexibility along the axial directions. So if you consider that then the total extension due to the external force that is f j or f f will be equal to f initial and this is again extended that is there is an extension if you say k f is the the spring constant of the bolt then definitely the bolt acts like a spring because it has some longitudinal flexibility and this is the delta is nothing but the deflections of the bolt. Similarly, the joint will be f initial minus k joint times delta. So, here the kinematic relationship is that delta is same in both the cases. So, the amount by which the gasket is inflated is the amount by which the bolt is stressed, the bolt is uh, elongated. Now, if you consider this, then these three relations will give you the value that f j, if you use that f f will be equal to f initial and delta, delta is nothing but if you calculate then delta will be equal to f external divided by k f plus k j. So, if you use that then this becomes k f divided by k f plus a j times f external. So, this is the relation which we get. Now, you can write this f initial plus 1 upon 1 plus k j divided by k f times f external. What we see here that this is a factor f initial plus c times f external. So, here we have <coughs> a factor c which is multiplied with f, f external. So, therefore, all the, the entire load is not taken by the fasteners, but only take a part. Now, if k j is much much larger than k f that is the joint stiffness is too large then of course, this terms goes very high and c becomes very very low. In ideal in ideal situations we can have c almost equal to 0 and that is when there is no, uh, no gasket in between then k j is very very large uh, compared to k f and it can have a very small value c has c can have a very small value, but it uh, then one can see that by having a very small value of c, one can apply a very large value of f external. That is we can if we have c is uh, 0, then we can apply infinity, infinite amount of external force, but that is in fact not true, because this statement what you are seeing here, this one. This is true for to some extent. If delta is too large, then f j becomes negative, but f j cannot take any negative load. So, therefore, we can have a, 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 an upper bound on delta and that means the upper bound on, on f external as you can see from here. So, therefore, we cannot apply any arbitrary amount of load here, but we will have to apply the load such a way that contact the gasket joint contact does not get loosen. These are the considerations we will have to give. Now, how to calculate this k f? k f we can use the very known formula that is we can consider this to be a rod. If we apply force 
then um, the deformations. So, delta will be equal to f times l divided by E a. So, therefore, k will k f is almost equal to E a divided by L. <coughs> but what about k j? k j calculations of k j is very very complicated. When you have a gasket joint then the other f parameters that is uh, remember that there were other elements if you consider the last example there was the cover plate then j gasket and then this one. So, the entire joint stiffness is based on the center combinations and the gasket being very softer material compared to the other uh, materials. So, the entire stiffness will be due to the gasket, but really whenever there is no gasket then calculation becomes tremendously complicated. What we can take that we make some simplifications and we take first term. For example, here these are the two plates <coughs> and we have a bolt here. So now, when you take the joint stiffness of the of this combinations, then we take instead of the plate, we take this frustrum. Forget about the entire plate, but only take this amount and consider the stiffness based on this part. This also becomes complicated exact analysis will give very cumbersome results. Normally, in the design we you make use of some empirical relationship that is uh, some ex experimental values of C. So, what we are going to see now the C they are measured C's are measured experimentally. In the next slide, we are going to see uh, the val various values of C for various kinds of joint. Now, <coughs> this is how the bowls are to be designed whenever there is pre stress. So, we have F F is equal to F initial plus C times F external. We calculate sigma based on F F and all other relationship for the pre stress uh, for the for uh, pre stress will be equal to same as that without pre stress. Now, we are going to see some of the values of C. Now, for metal to metal joint you see then this joint becomes very steep and the compliance that is K j becomes very high compared to K f. I am sorry this is k j and therefore, c almost becomes 0. For the narrow copper ring, we have 0 0.01. For lead gasket with stars, we have 0 0.10. For soft copper gasket, it is 0 0.40. For copper asbestos gasket, it is about 0 0.60 soft gasket with bolt it is 0 0.90 and soft gasket with stud this is 1. <coughs> now, these are the values used while uh, designing the joints um, that is the designing the bolts with pre stress. Now, let us calculate what are the types of stresses in uh, in introduced in preloading. What we see is that 
the tensile stress is introduced of course that is very obvious. Sometimes the preloading introduces shear stress because what you see here there are two plates which are to be joined and the bolt is there. and we tighten it, we give a torque there. So, if you consider uh, this surface, then there will be some frictional torque acting, frictional force will act and that will cause the frictional torque. If you draw the free body diagram of the bolt, then it looks like so this part here what we see is the frictional torque acting. So, you can give external torque T external for the tightening and that will cause this T f which is equal to frictional frictional torque. So, if you find if you calculate the the shear stress due to torsions then of course, you will have some non trivial value. So, each point will be subjected to some shear stress because of this of this frictional torque developed uh, between the uh, two meetings, the meeting surfaces that is the surface between uh, the contact points between the bolt and the surface. Then there will be other stress which is the bending stress and that occurs whenever we have two misaligned or non parallel surfaces. Now, what we are considering suppose we want to join one plate with the other. Now, unlike the previous situations here we consider that this plate is not properly aligned. So, there is some angle alpha between these two and we introduce some we use a bolt and tighten. Definitely while tightening the bolt will bend ok. So, there will be a bending stress developed. What will be that bending stress? Let us calculate. Suppose the, bend, the bending moment is m and this angle here is the alpha. So, therefore, we have this famous relationship that is E i del to w del x square is m, which while double integration gives E i w is m x square where we measure x from this point let us say x is measured from this point. So, m x square by 2 plus c 1 x plus c 2 and we have this boundary conditions that is at x equal to 0 w equal to 0 that gives c equal to c 2 equal to 0 and this is again clamped at this end. So, therefore, at x equal to 0 w prime is equal to 0 this gives c 1 equal to 0 and we are left with this expressions. Now, the slope at x equal to l at x equal to l slope is equal to w, um, w prime where w is this displacement from this axis. So, this becomes m l divided by e i and that is approximately equal to alpha. So, once alpha has some value, then we can get m to be alpha e i divided by l, where l is the length, l is the length of this bolt. Definitely what we see here that because of this bending, a bending moment is developed and this bending moment causes a bending stress. The bending stress again 
is given by the famous formula that is sigma bending is m y by i. So, a bending stress will be developed when we have misaligned surface. This is very important because the bending stress may be very, very large so that the material may fail. So, we have to ensure that these two mating surfaces are parallel and if it cannot be ensured then we sometimes use spherical washer. So, sometimes we use spherical washers. Okay. These are uh, sphere like uh, semi spherical washers and uh, very effective for that purpose. So, these are roughly the number of uh, the different kinds of stresses introduced while preloading. Now, design of bowls for dynamic loading. Here, the dynamic loading. this is very important and when we design them, design the bowls for the dynamic loading, then some important data are to be considered. What the first one is the stress amplitude and mean stress, that is very important and you have already learnt about it in the design of strength, that is whenever we have a stress which is fluctuating something like this and this is varying with time, this is sigma it has some maximum value sigma max and minimum value sigma mean. Then a mean stress is developed as sigma max plus sigma mean divided by 2 and amplitude stress amplitude sigma amp is sigma max minus sigma mean divided by and we have very uh, fatigue failure criteria based on this sigma mean and sigma amplitude relationship. Then the next is the fatigue stress concentration factor. Normally for the uh, ductile material fatigue stress, con uh, the stress concentration factor is not very important, but for the brittle material it is very important. For ductile materials it is not so because the, the plastic deformations will take place which will reduce the stress concentrations anyway. But whenever we have fatigue loading, then we have to take this fatigue stress concentration factor. So, this, this is again tabulated, we have for various, for uh, various kinds of bowls, we have various fatigue stress concentrations factor. Then the corrected endurance strength. corrected endurance strength, the endurance strength we all know sigma e, but it is measured for some particular type of experiments namely the bending experiments, but for different kinds of loading we will have different factors. So, there are few factors, one is load factor, then maybe the surface finish factor, surface factor, maybe the temperature factor. So, everything has to be taken care and we will have to get sigma e prime which is the corrected value of this uh, endurance strength. Then the yield strength or ultimate strength, this is of course very much needed and the factor of safety. So, this uh, data must be supplied to the designer. Once these data are known, then of course, we use various criteria that is suppose we know sigma max. Uh, sigma mean value and sigma amplitude, then there is a there is an endurance diagram where sigma mean and sigma amplitude is plotted. Then there is one line which is known as the Soderberg line and that line here. So, this is this goes up to S y the ill strength and this is S e. When we, when we have a factor of safety, then there is a factor of safety, we get to S y prime and S e prime. So, the design must be such that it falls, any design data will fall on this line. 
So therefore, we have this relationship that is sigma mean divided by Sy prime which is equal to Sy divided by factor of safety plus S sigma amplitude divided by Se divided by factor of safety is equal to 1. And now here we will have to introduce this fatigue stress concentration factor over here. So, this is the relationship which we use. There are other relationships known as Goodman's line or Gerber's line, but Soderberg's lines are uh, most often used. And this relationship will give you the value of uh, different uh, things like the if you want the factor of safety or the area of the bolt, you can calculate with the help of this line. We are going, we will uh, discuss more about that in a later uh, lecture uh, devoted entirely to the variable loading. So, now the fatigue stress concentration factors, these are the fatigue stress concentration factor for metric grade, this is uh, 3.5 to for metric grade uh, 3.5 5.8 it is for the roll thread it is 2.2 for the cut thread 2.8 2.1 for fillet and so on 6.6 .6 to 10.9 this is 3.0 3.8 and 2.3 then we have the fully corrected endurance strain these are roughly the uh, some guidelines ISO 8.8 M16 to M36 it is 129 mega Pascal it increases as you go incre on increasing to ISO 12.9 where it for M1.6 to M36 that is for the metric grade 1.6 to M36 it is 190 mega Pascal. These are all to be found out in the uh, handbook. Now <coughs> there is a small homework problem given the homework problem looks like here the cylinder head of a steam engine is subjected to steam pressure of, of 0.7 mega Pascal. It is held in position by 12 bolts which will take equally the entire load. Soft copper gaskets are used. Do you remember for the soft copper gasket it was 0.4 to make the joint leak proof. Now in this case of course we have the initial force and this is to be found out using this relationship 2.2840D. Now, this is these are used to make the joint leak proof. If the effective diameter of the cylinder is 300 millimeter, find the size of bowl so that the stress does not exceed 100 mega Pascal. You will have to use different data uh, supplied to the design handbook or you can use the data from this lecture itself. The answer to this homework problem will be given in the next lecture. So, now we come to the end of this lecture. We have discussed how to design a bolt for the static loading as well as for the variable loading. For the static loading we had the pre-stress and sometimes we did not have the pre-stress. The advantage of pre-stress being that the bolts will uh, be relieved of the external load to some extent, but we cannot um, at our will we cannot ex uh, increase this external load because in that case the contact will be loosened and the uh, load will again increase in the bolt. For the variable loading we have uh, used uh, Soderbergh's line, but there are other criteria possible we are we will use them um, in some more details in a later chapter. So, uh, we come to the end. Thank you very much.